On today's show, John St. Pierre, uh, an entrepreneur, you'll hear how he cut his teeth originally with College Pro, as did I actually, and how he learned principles there that he's continued to apply to go a number of other businesses, including Legacy Global Sports and Brand Point Services from 50 to $100 million. He's written on this, now speaks about this broadly. Here's my conversation with John St. Pierre. John, thanks for joining us here today. Happy to see you. I, I guess from New Hampshire, where where exactly in New Hampshire are you located? Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Portsmouth, which is, I think you were saying, just north of Boston, right? Yeah, exactly. One hour north of Boston. It's really there's a strip of land between Massachusetts and Maine, and that's New Hampshire right on the ocean. That's where we are. There you go. And what kind of winter did you have? Pretty mild. Pretty mild. It's tracked her out a couple of times, but, uh, but other than that, it's been a pretty good one. We're expecting one more to come sometime in the, you know, this month. We'll see what happens, but pretty good overall. What do you get? You get a big dump of snow or how does that look when uh, when you say winter or get the tractor out? Yeah, so we get uh, we live right on the ocean here, which we get a little bit of the ocean effect, which means it doesn't snow as much right near the ocean, more inland uh, and in the mountains of New Hampshire and Maine. So but when we do get dumped on, we get some dump. We got to get out there with the snow blower and, and get that off the driveway. But usually within a few days down here, it's it's gone. So when you have a mild winter, you're in good shape. There you go. And uh, so Canadian uh, originally, what uh, took you to New Hampshire? How did you find yourself down there? Yeah, so I grew up in the Montreal area uh, and I uh, went through my high school years there and wanted to play hockey in the United States and, and uh, found an opportunity to come down and play college hockey, got an accounting degree in, in school. And, uh, you know, once you're down here and you see the opportunities and, and career opportunities that were here present from my college years, um, you know, took a job right out of college and kind of never looked back. I uh, got married, have kids, uh, established a family down here, still have all my family back in Montreal, but uh, now loving, loving life down here. How do you get back and forth? It's, I guess it's not much of a drive, is it? Yeah, it's only about four and a half hours to Montreal from uh, from the Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. So pretty easy to get back and go visit. And uh, I used to live in Chicago. That was a little more difficult. <laughs> Had to you know get on the planes for those. But uh, yeah, nice and close now. Yeah, Chicago is a nice hub. So easy to go back and forth from there. So yeah, down New Hampshire. And what kind of work did you begin doing out of college? Yeah, so uh, in college, you you may appreciate this because it's a big uh, Canadian Ontario thing. But uh, in college, I was a college pro painting franchise, uh, or, and so uh, for two summers in college, I ran my own college painting business and was taught how to run a business from you know entrepreneurial roots and and really how to hire, train, fire, sell, estimate, uh, do your own accounting, payroll, and all those kinds of things as a college student. And uh, post college, the the franchise company. Uh, actually, they were called the franchise company. They own College Pro Painters, Sir Pro Painters, a whole bunch of other franchise contracting companies. Hired me to be a general manager and move out to the Midwest and hire and train college students to run their own painting business. So did that for, for a couple of years. That's what brought me to Chicago. Fair enough. Uh, I I ran a College Pro franchise as well. A number of good friends have as well, really? which is uh, interesting. I did mine in the Kingston area as I went to Queens. Yeah. Uh, I had to get a couple of good friends. So yeah, I know the uh, I know the pedigree. Uh, and it's interesting to hear that uh, you were, I guess, groomed or they asked you to stay on. So you must have, you must have excelled particularly. Where were you operating your franchises? Yeah, so I was operating franchises in the state of Maine. Uh, that's where I went to school. And so I had the franchises uh, there. And you, you'll appreciate this, JP. The year before I became a college pro franchise, I was here going to school in the United States. But I didn't have a work visa. I had a student visa, so I couldn't actually go work anywhere. Like, you know, I couldn't go work at a bar or a restaurant or do a summer job. So my best friend, Stefano Morelli, who went to Queens University, had a great idea. He said, all my friends from Queens are going to plant trees in Northern Ontario. We should go plant trees. So sure enough, we grabbed our backpacks that summer. My first summer in the United States, went back with him, went to Northern Ontario to plant trees, lived in the wilderness for a couple of months, I uh, got paid 10 cents a tree, getting bitten by black flies and, and everything else. We hitchhiked all the way home to Montreal. And I said, next year, I'm going to figure out a way to stay in the United States. <laughs> and that's where I found College Pro as a franchise opportunity because a little interesting law piece here, you know, if you, you can own a limited liability company in the United States and not have a work visa or a green card, right? And so I was able to run my own business and hire uh, employees that were paid W-2 but I was able to do that as uh, as a visa as a, on a student visa, and that's why that gave me an opportunity to run my own painting business in the state of the United States that following summer. There you go. It's so interesting, right? The ways that uh, we can organize and do uh, where there's a will, there's a way. You learn some great business concepts, obviously through that through the, that exercise. And you said, did you do accounting in school as well? Is that what uh, you were studying uh, at the at the college level? 
Exactly. My, my father said, if you're going to go to the, to the United States you know, and do business, I want you to specialize somewhere. You can't just specialize in business. So he, he pushed me into an accounting road, but I didn't really want to be an accountant. So you know, going to do internships in an accounting firm wasn't as exciting to me, uh, but running my own business was. And that's kind of what led me there. And then same thing post-college. I didn't really want to go work for a big public accounting firm. Uh, so I took the opportunity with College Pro to go be a general manager and continue that entrepreneurial route. Very good. So you do that for, I guess, a couple of years. And where where's your path lead from there? Yeah, so this this time period, JP, was around the late 90s. So, you know, I became a general manager uh, from 96 to 98, and the internet is buzzing. This dot-com thing is happening. Anybody who's sane has to leave their well-paid career job to go follow this dot-com thing. So I was one of those guys. And uh, a bunch of general managers from College Pro, led by Eric Devley, one of the, one of the top general managers of the company, uh, he founded a company called handymanonline.com which was an online contractor referral service. So you need your kitchen done, your house painted, you go on and we'd send you pre-screen contractors. Well, we all left our jobs at College Pro to go join Eric on this venture, got VC funded, got uh, $25 million of venture funding from Silicon Valley. And we were cooking with gas, you know, traveling around the country, opening up all these offices, all these sales reps, bringing all these contractors to fulfill, you know, homeowners needs. And uh, then the crash happened. And we were supposed to get another round of 50 million to really take us to the next level. And that funding never came. Uh, and the company somewhat kind of imploded from within, uh, ended up selling all of the assets the bank did ultimately to a company called Service Magic, which was then rebranded homeadvisor.com, which was then merged with Angie. So Angie right now was really at the roots of it, handymanonline.com that never passed through the dot-com era. Yeah, and, and, and that's what happens in business cycles, right? Uh, companies take shape, they take form, they might uh, pass uh, through from one to another, merger, acquisition, hopefully the core asset, uh, there's some value that's been created there and you're able to leverage it and take advantage of it. Sounds like that's what they did. Uh, where do you go from there? Obviously, I would imagine as part of that implosion, you're on to the next venture. Yeah, well, not so easily. Uh, you know, I was 24 at the time when this imploded and, you know, you got to imagine that in your early twenties, you just graduated college, you have tons of stock options and this dot-com venture funded company, you think you got this whole thing figured out. You know, I, I thought this business thing was easy. I'm traveling around the country, seeing, you know, every state, every, excuse me, every state and every city in the United States, which was very fun for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, the moment was, you know, getting let go from this business that I thought, you know, was everything for me. And uh, I was living in Beaverton, Oregon at the time. So right outside of Portland. And I got in my gray Jeep Cherokee and I started driving back towards Chicago. And uh, I had with me, I had just recently purchased uh, Tony Robbins personal power tapes and I had never listened to them before. So I started popping them in. This is a good opportunity. I'm going to listen to these things and basically listen to Tony Robbins personal power all the way back to Chicago, taking my time, trying to figure out what am I going to do next? Uh, what exactly am I going to do? And I received the call from Charlie Chase. Charlie was the co-founder of Serta Pro Painters. He was the original guy who took College Pro from, college, from Canada to the United States, uh, then formed Serta Pro Painters. Um, he had known me through the College Pro ranks and he gave me a call. He had an e-commerce company in Philadelphia. He had made an investment in. He was looking for someone to kind of help salvage that as well because it was going through the same uh, crisis during that time period as all the other e-commerce companies um, and so we invited me out to Philadelphia to come take a look and I did and I, I went out to Philadelphia I uh, became the president of a company called world at my door uh, dot com which was basically a group on meets city search well before its time uh, for small businesses and communities for couponing and uh, we, we ended up salvaging that product a couple of years later and uh, exiting uh, for you know a small little recovery uh, of some of his investments. So that's kind of where I headed to Chicago, Philadelphia next. And that's kind of where I ended up. Wow, it's amazing. Uh, we had similar similar uh, experiences, I guess, at the time. I was, uh, again, subsequent to College Pro, I went down to California and worked with a couple of buddies and I grew a .com. It's interesting you said the City Search because uh, we were growing a company that uh, was one of the largest competitors to City Search. Uh, at one point, we actually explored a merger. Uh, wow. That fell apart. The company was subsequently sold to... Uh, to, uh, I guess at the time it was Compaq uh, and uh, merged with another company to form Alta Vista. So one of the first, uh, oh, wow. first private engines. But it's, it's interesting. Do you mind sharing what the name of that company was? So the company I was at was uh, called Zip2. Okay. Um, so the company at the time was, was called Zip2. It was actually started, so a couple of friends, I don't know if you probably recognize the names now, but Elon and Kimball Musk started that company. Huh. Uh, back in the day, friends from Queens. And as I say, that company was grown and 
sold, uh, you know, and then, you know, from that or the next spin out becoming uh, PayPal and on and on. Right. But it's kind of that interesting that sort of, uh, you know, the thesis is take an asset, try to create value from it, spin it, uh, grow it. You know, if it doesn't always work, get up, do the next thing, keep working on it. Right. Cause these businesses do grow and they do succeed. If we, if you put your mind to it and are willing to work through the obstacles. Yeah. That's, yeah. The story sounds very familiar. I just don't know who those Musk guys are though. But. Yeah, exactly. A couple of those names, but that one that is not too familiar. Yeah, exactly. So it's interesting. You do all of that. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Charlie Chase is well known for you know the, the growth there. What does he do after that? Or what's the next project after that in Philadelphia? Yeah, so um, you know he was still the CEO of Server Pro Painters. Uh, he actually took a, a couple of years off, went back to be the CEO of Server Pro Painters. Charlie today is the, the CEO of California Closets, a very large uh, you know remodeling company down here in the United States. I think they're also in Canada as well, I believe, at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was kind of, okay, now what do I do? I, I, you know, I have this new opportunity to start afresh and, um, I actually started a, a commercial project management company. I had, I had a lot of experience finding contractors with handyman online. Mm -hmm. I had met a partner, uh, who, uh, who became a partner, I should say, uh, who used to work for Fuji film and, uh, I spent 14 years of Fuji film and Fuji at the time was getting away from film. And they were moving to digital, right? So digital cameras are now coming out. It's the early 2000s, 2002, 2003. And, you know, you can't bring your digital camera to Walmart and ask for the four by six prints. Uh, you have to take this SD card out of your camera. And what we were doing is we were installing these kiosks in all the Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS's, Walmart, Sam's Club. So people could bring their digital you know, card, put it into the kiosk and order their prints. Then in the mini lab would print them and bring them out to you and go, here are your pictures. And so they had to install 3000 of these across the country. And I said to my partner, Jeff, I said, look, you get the contract. I can find the contractors. I know how to find contractors all across the country. And uh, we formed a company called Rombos Group and started off with a list of 3000 sites to go, you know, project manage these installations, uh, roll the camera 20 years later, JP, uh, that company is now called Brandpoint Services. We're north of a hundred million dollar uh, national commercial services provider uh, in in the United States and Canada. Amazing, and again, that same that growth trajectory, right? Create that value and grow that uh, uh, grow that value, right? Exactly. Um, and so now you're on the hundred million dollar journey. Uh, tell us uh, a little a little of what uh, is involved with the hundred million dollar journey. Yeah, exactly. So I had a book that came out in 2023, late 2023, called the Hundred Million Dollar Journey. And I just shared the story of that one company that went, you know, started off in 2003 is now a hundred million dollar company. But in between all of that, JP, there's another story. And there's a story of massive failure. Um, when I started that project management company called Rhombus Group in 2003, I also found myself back in the roots of sports and hockey. And uh, a couple of best friends and I got together and said, look, why don't we start this little hobby hockey business where we can bring youth hockey teams over to Europe and do international tours. And guess what? You know, we'll get free trips to Europe. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's let's put this thing together. It wasn't really a business. It was more of a hobby. Well, that business started to take off. And we started doing more and more international tours, uh, youth hockey tournaments, youth hockey camps, uh, teams, and a whole bunch of different things. And so my project management company was growing. And the sports company was growing at the same click. And then 2008 happened, the Great Recession. And guess what happens to contracting businesses in 2008, right? They kind of halt and come to a stop, if not a dip but parents are still spending money on their kids. So I woke up on the aftermath of 2008 and the sports company was around a $10 million business and the project management company was around a $5 million business. And I said, listen, I'm passionate about sports. Uh, let me take this company and keep growing it. And um, came up with an aggressive plan to grow that company from 10 million to hundred million in five years. A lot of stories in between that, but at the crux of it, uh, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, let me build one of the largest youth sports companies in the world. And we started growing and we started acquiring. We acquired 14 other uh, sporting businesses. Uh, we brought on investors. Uh, we started, you know, keep building the business. And we grew that business uh, to north of $50 million in global revenues. And we were ready to bring on another round of capital. And we did so. We brought in around $20 million of capital. Um, and six months later, I was fired. And that's after 15 years of building this, this, this business uh, I put myself in extremely vulnerable positions and was terminated from the company that I had co-founded. It was my love, dream, and passion. Uh, it was the culture and, 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 and business I always dreamed of having with all my best friends in it. Um, and, uh, and I lost it all. And it was in that moment of failure 
and picking myself back off the ground and I looked over to my left and I saw the little engine that could contracting company uh, that was still, you know, a small business. And I said, you know what, I got to, I got to synthesize these learnings. Like what did I learn introspectively through this experience? Apply those learnings to that business and see if I can get this to work. And we subsequently grew that company from 5 million to north of a hundred million um, the right way. Yeah, that's so interesting. You see the right way as well, because you were on track with the previous, and I've I've had countless founders on that uh, um, have, have you know in one way or another exited or been exited from uh, their baby, right, from the co company they've created. That's another whole topic, right? That's another whole conversation. You have obviously you know through hard work, but also know how been able to grow a number of businesses that way. So, what are some of the lessons or some of those things that you say you learned from the first that you were able to apply to the second to get to that hundred million plus? Yeah, well, you, you, what you said there is very key. Like a lot of entrepreneurs can grow. And so in my mindset, when I was growing the sports company, JP, I was like, grow, grow, grow. I was growing for the sake of growing. I just knew I could sell. I knew I could go acquire. I knew I could build the team. I knew I could do all those different things. And I was just going hard and fast. But there's a lot of essential elements that I was omitting. And so in the book, The $100 Million Dollar Journey, I talk about seven principles of entrepreneurial success. And I'll just rattle them off and you tell me which ones connect. But you know, principle one is protect and grow your equity at all costs. Principle two is build your own capital through net operating cash flow of your business. You don't have to go hat in hand to banks and financiers to, you know, get, dilute principle one, your equity. Principle three, reinvest smartly. Don't chase shiny objects and run all over the place. Reinvest to grow your operating capital so you can actually protect your equity. So they all kind of go in sequence here. Principle four, build a culture of entrepreneurs entrepreneurship within your organization where people treat your business as if it's their own. Principle five, protect the house. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in running a business. How do you protect every single hole in the boat? Principle six, how do you access owner's liquidity in tax efficient ways? So you can keep the maximum amount of cash flow in your business to continue to grow without needing investors to grow. And principle seven, how do you move from CEO to chairperson so you can do the thing that everybody always tells you to do. They always tell you work on your business, not in your business, John. I'm like, how do I do that? I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm totally stressed. I don't have time to do that. How do you move from CEO to chairperson so you can be more strategic about the growth of your business? So those are the seven principles that I learned that I failed miserably in scenario A, that I applied to the business in scenario B, and within a short period of time was able to grow a business, like I said, the right way. It's so powerful. And your seven principles are are really different than a lot of the principles that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs would put uh, as uh, the key principles. Although I have to think that you've hit it on the head and that we're talking about business here. And I think what you're focused on is, you know, a for-profit business, it begins with the capital, right? It begins with the cash. And it sounds like that's something, obviously through the years, as you've sought investments and tried to grow companies, you've known the importance of having that cash, but you've got a different perspective with it now, or I guess, maybe even a different paradigm with it. Can you explain more what that looks like? Because it's part of the it's part of this uh, uh, first few principles you discuss, or actually it runs all the way through uh, the thinking that you've uh, that you've put into the book. Yeah, and certainly from from a law perspective, right? Like, how many times do you see partnerships fail? A lot, and a lot of those times they don't have clear operating agreements. They don't have good buy sell agreements. They they just decided to marry each other and go into business together 50 50 to realize years later they don't even like each other. Uh, you know, business is like a marriage and JP, as confident as I was, that I could grow things. I never really started a business myself. I always brought partners on board. Hey, come on, let's go. You know, we'll do a third, a third, a third or 50, 50 or 25, 25, 25, 25, right? Um, why? I lacked the confidence. I didn't have the capital, uh, whatever the reasons were, we put ourselves in these positions only to find ourselves years later, trying to unwind these particular situations. <laughs> But the way you're going to monetize and build wealth for yourself and your family and, and really build something you truly love and adore is through this thing called equity. And how do you protect and grow that equity over time? And in this scenario of success, I actually started off as a 25% partner in that business back in 2003. But over time, I bought more equity into the business, bought partners out to have a majority control and ownership in the business. Whereas in the other scenario of failure, I started off as a 33%. And the day I got fired, I owned 8.37%. Right. Of the company I co-founded, my vision, my baby, my everything. And I glamorized, oh, we just raised $20 million of capital. Look how cool we are, right? So we glamorize the wrong thing as entrepreneurs. I mean, I'd much rather own 100% of a $10 million business than 10% of a $100 million business. 
because I know I'm in control of my own destiny. I can build something for the long haul. And, and that's a piece that really, I, I, although I went to accounting school, although I had a lot of mentors, I learned from a lot of entrepreneurs and read books. And I, I to, totally missed the concept and principle on how to protect your own equity and how building your own cash out of your business and being very frugal and earning your own net operating cash flow so you can reinvest in your business is a lot better than going to put bank debt on your business, bringing investors in and getting diluted, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And uh, John, I think it's I think it's important what you said. And as a lawyer, I appreciate it. I'm not sure if everybody listening does. Uh, that equity is so important. It's so expensive initially when you talk about you know the 50-50 or the third or third or third, and then to just uh, give it away or not give it away, but to turn it over to investors, you need to do that very wisely and sensitive to the value of that equity. If you're going to grow the company the way you just described, right? If you're going to grow a company, you know, from 10 to $100 million, well, that equity initially is going to be very, very expensive equity. And so as you deal with it, with those initial partners, right? Uh, you want to have a good shares agreement. You want a good operating agreement to describe what the respective rights and obligations are, uh, to, to describe what happens if things go wrong, right? That's that's the important thing. It's I often describe them as, an operating manual for the for the owners of the company, so they yeah. so they can understand what is to occur with it. Um, I'm presuming that you didn't have very good ones to begin with, uh, and uh, you're now focused on on ensuring that as you build companies, you put proper paperwork in place. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know to the point. There's a bunch of different things that you said that that tie into each other, right? I do think entrepreneurs give away equity way too loosely and give it away is a big word. Maybe not to investors. You can't say they're giving it away. But how many times you have a Undervaluing it, though. business owner say, you know what? Hey, come work for me. I'm going to give you 10% of the business. Yes. They don't even think about the terminal value of that 10%. They just think, oh, I want to really attract JP to my business. I'm going to give you equity, right? So they do that. They don't think about the terminal value of it. But then on the investor front or the operating agreement front to the question you just asked, I mean, all these times I drafted operating agreements, all of the times, buy, sell agreements, everything. I had a corporate attorney who would assist me with them. But I never had my own attorney looking for my interest. From your perspective, that's right. And from my perspective, I, JB, I didn't understand the difference. I was like, what do you mean? Like the corporate attorney, I'm the one working with the corporate attorney. And and they would say, yeah, I understand. But the corporate attorney is looking for the business's interest. But who's in looking at your interest? I, well, I don't need to do that. The corporate attorney is going to do that as an example, right? And so we would go into these sophisticated investor uh, situations where the investors had their attorney. And we had our business attorney, but there was no John attorney in the room, right? Taking care of my stuff. And I was penny wise and dollar foolish. It was like, well, I, why do I have to pay for my own attorney to do that? I don't need that, right? Well, guess what? After 15 years of growing a company north of $50 million, I lost everything because I didn't protect myself. I really did not protect myself. And a really good friend of mine, Jeff Wall, he's the, the CEO and owner of Handyman Connection, another franchise group in the United States. He would always tell me, John, you always have to go into these agreements with the end in mind. You always got to protect yourself in every agreement at all times. And by the way, he had told me this well before <laughs> these situations happen. But until it happens to you, you kind of brush it off a little bit. That's ah, never going to happen to me. I got this thing. And you have this air of overconfidence. Um, and yeah, not protecting yourself with your right, your own counsel for you anytime you're dealing with a business agreement is something that I completely changed. Yeah. And uh, again, there will be people listening that, that miss the essence of what you just described, right? Uh, because an attorney is going to, a, a corporate attorney is working for the company. Uh, it's important for business owners to have at least independent thought on their behalf, independent advisor on their behalf, if not uh, an, an attorney looking out, as you say, for, for their for their interest as well. Uh, because things things can go wrong or things can go sideways. And so it's important to think through those scenarios and have maybe some some thought given to, what will occur as each of those each of those does? Um, you describe the growth. You describe you know two oh eight right something actually uh, outside of the control of the business owners uh, impacts the business. Well, then what happens? You got to bring capital in. What how, you know what what does that look like? And then how do you how do you navigate? I guess the new circumstances. Uh, really, really key stuff. Uh, you're obviously in a spot now where you're describing or making sure that other people. Uh, understand the principles at hand as well. What what lies in the future? What, what are you building now or what, what projects are you working on now? Yeah, so I guess on two fronts, JP, um, Rhombus Group, which is the original brand that we started in 2003, is now formed into a holding company. 
So I have a holding company with uh, five other small immune sized businesses, including the one we talked about today that um, I work with the CEOs and mentor the CEOs and presidents of those companies to continue to grow. And I'm the chairperson of those businesses um, as, a, as my own commercial interest there. And then I'm also now uh, spending a lot of time coaching and mentoring entrepreneurs, a lot of them in that five to $20 million range. They've been in business 10 plus years. They have a vision of growing like 5Xing or 10Xing their company in the future, but I don't want them to make the same mistakes I've made. And so, you know, part of my mission right now in life is to help entrepreneurs build the business of their dreams without falling off the cliff, without making those catastrophic mistakes that you can make when you're trying to go from a lifestyle business to a high performance business. It's a very rocky terrain and there's a lot of vultures in there. And it's a very dangerous area that you can find yourself losing the business you put your heart and soul into. And so I'm a, really on a mission to help entrepreneurs protect that and, and coaching them along the way. Yeah, so you've been there, you've done that. And how, so how do you get uh, compensated for that? Or what's your, what does your involvement look like for somebody listening that might be interested in working with you? Yeah, so we do um, strategic planning meetings with entrepreneurs to lay out like a full you know, 10-year strategic plan all the way down to what they should be doing. And we do sessions like that with companies. Uh, and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, with entrepreneurs that fit specifically that set. And there's a monthly retainer for that, where I work with them on, on the goals for the business. We lay out the strategic plan and then, okay, you know, we'll work on a three-year engagement to hit this BHAG that you set for this business, but also protecting you and making sure you don't veer off course, chasing side objects or bringing on investors or taking on debt. Uh, how do we do it the right way and create net operating cash flow in this business? So, um, you know, do it through those mechanisms. I, I provide a lot of, um, you know, content and tools uh, from the book, uh, I have a free workbook uh, that you can download at uh, 100mjourney.com. Uh, you can go download. I think there's like $10,000 plus valuable tools in terms of financial templates and, and things that I've used in my businesses that you can go download and use yourself or even book a free consultation. And I'll walk through with you uh, kind of how to use those tools for your business uh, if, if that's of any assistance. That's great. And it sounds like, John, as you described it, it even seems to go back to some of the principles that we were learning back in the college pro days, right? Uh, which makes sense. There's There were good business principles there being taught. taught a lot of business owners. Uh, Kimball and I have still talked about some of the things we learned there and how it relates to some of the things that we even continue to do to this day. Sounds like the same things actually occurred for you. Uh, and you're able to leverage that along all the other lessons you've learned along the way, right? Yeah, extremely foundational. Uh, in, in the book, the first part of the book, I talk about my entrepreneurial journey and story for as a teenager. And, and I spend a couple of chapters really on that college pro experience and actually all the things I learned through massive turmoil and failure. How am I going to pay my painters on Friday? And oh my gosh, I had to loan money from my father to cover a bill one week. And oh my gosh, I never loaned money from my father. And the loan agreement he put in place for me and all those foundational tools, no question, college pro was foundational. Uh, to that growth and success and learnings um, and something that I, I truly cherish. That's fantastic stuff. And so you've got it all online there. What was the name of the, uh, or where was the, uh, uh, the URL again, if you could just say it for people to listen. Yeah, it, it's uh, 100M as in million, 100mjourney.com. Uh, but some of the other things that you're involved with as well, we're getting a lot of conversations now, with pe people looking at where business is going or where the future of things are. A lot of questions about AI, crypto, all these types of things. What type of, uh, what types of way do you play in those spaces as well? Yeah. So, you know, now as a mentor and coach entrepreneurs, I'm always trying to sharpen my saw. So a lot, listening to a lot of content on, on YouTube, um, uh, you know, meeting with a lot of professionals. Uh, I have a podcast as well called the Entrepreneurs United Podcast. We're bringing on a lot of professionals in these different areas like you. It's just always sharpening our saw, right? It's part of what is so powerful now. Um, you know, last year we had an event in Austin, Texas. We had uh, Dr. Luke, Luke Wilson, who's an AI specialist down there, come talk to all our entrepreneurs about how this AI thing is changing business and how it can help, you know, you increase your operational efficiencies, really, at the end of the day uh, to produce and where how that opens up other avenues. So from an AI perspective, uh, the tools that are out there, I think there's a lot of game gamemanship around that. And there's a lot of marketing tools out there. But we're really starting to find now different ways to use the technology to increase operational efficiencies within our current team so they can do more. And I think operational productivity is a major source to margin development. So we're looking at a lot of tools in that area. And you see a lot of tools, you know, we're on salesforce.com, have been for 20 years. Um, you know, all the AI being integrated there, integrated in the Google suite and a whole bunch of different areas. And if you don't have somebody in your business that's kind of your, your czar, if you will, to kind of try and find these little opportunities, like something as silly as put your HR, uh, excuse me, your employee handbook in a tool that people can query and ask it questions uh, to find out the answers versus emailing the HR person, right? Like there's a lot of small tools like that that are happening. And uh, yeah, blockchain technology and crypto, that's a whole different story, but doing the same in that area as well. 
So yeah, let's start with the first because you're so right. I mean, as we discuss AI, uh, people need to be aware. And I think we're all now uh, abundantly aware that it's going to change everything. You know, it's in the process of changing things. And the way that uh, I think that we're focused on right now is to leverage it, right? Uh, everyone's discussing what are the tools, what are the best tools, the most effective tools, and how can we leverage them for whatever purpose, right? For whatever goal we're working towards. What kind of tools have you seen? Or I mean, you mentioned Salesforce, so, you know, obviously the Google uh, suite of products that are evolving. Uh, what are the types of tools you see that have been effective to this point to use? And what do you see the future of those? Yeah, so... I developed the top 10 tools uh, for our entrepreneurs that I had researched that I thought were fantastic beyond the normal chat GPT, right? And uh, one tool that our team seems to be really uh, subscribing to and loving is a tool called Scribe. And Scribe is a tool where you can actually go on to your computer, go through the steps of how to do something, and it automatically creates the SOP manual for you, automatically. Here's how you do this step. And all you have to do is go click around your buttons and actually do the steps yourself. And our team just absolutely loves that because you know, go to your team and say, hey, we got to develop 100 SOPs for the SOPs that we're doing. And you know, 10 months later, someone's like, yeah, I'm on you know, the 10th one, you know, trying to get this approved by everybody. Uh, so the creation of SOPs digitally and automatically through your clicks is a massive tool that, that we really think uh, can, can move things. Uh, I mentioned Cody AI, I didn't mention its name, but Cody AI is the one where it can get trained on your particular documents and you can ask it questions and set up your own internal chatbot uh, for questions. And I think it's a great tool for HR type uh, components. You put in your employee handbook, you put your health and medical benefit plan and you can literally ask it, hey, what's my copay for this particular situation? And I'll answer the question. Because um, how many times you have to go through this hundred page manual to figure out what your yeah. PTO time is or whatever's going on, right? And then there's a lot of tools too, um, you know, uh, where we are testing, I mentioned, I won't mention ChatGPT, but I'll take it another level. There's ChatGPT teams now where you can actually train the model on your own information. And so one of the things we're trying to do is take a lot of our data and put it into it to figure out what can we query uh, on our own versus trying to figure out these complicated reports and different things. So those, those are three off the top of my head that I know our team is, is experimenting with and using. Really powerful stuff. And those are great. Thanks for that, John. Great examples, right? And so people need to be aware. And again, continue to scour, like you say, what's occurring. Uh, I hear constantly people complain that as soon as you, you know, decide to work with something or, or you know, decide that that's the, the way you're going to go, the rules change, right? Or the, the technology changes. Uh, it's just important to make sure that you're continuing to scour, continue to be on the forefront of this, because it is going to continue to change what we are seeing. And then, well, let's just discuss that, as I say, that intersection between crypto and AI as well. Are you seeing any projects that are grabbing your attention there? Yeah. So, you know, the AI part, uh, I find fascinating. I've been following it for a few years and I, I went through the current cycle uh, that, just, that, you know, that we're coming out of, I guess. Um, and really from a side, I had to really evaluate what is my interest in the space? Because I did chase some coins and some different things and, you know, had uh, Doge when Elon was going on Saturday Night Live. And I, I played a little bit of those games, right? And at the root of it, where, where I come out on, on it is if I don't understand it, I don't know if I want to be in it. I'm not a day trader. Uh, so go where I understand and I understand functionality. Uh, so I'm a big Ethereum uh, fan. Uh, I'm a big link, uh, chain link fan, uh, where I think there's going to be long-term uh, application to these particular tools. Um, you know, Arweave, the, the, the rendering, the, the rendering that I think Apple is using in their vision goggles, like there's a lot of tools like that. So I do believe that those projects that have long-term viability and I can see exactly how it's going to work are of interest to me. Uh, you know, certainly Bitcoin, I'm, I'm invested there from a store of value perspective, but I don't necessarily see the application, uh, but I, I view it as the gold piece. So I'm, I'm subscribing to that piece, but there's a lot of tools on now. You just hear these things like, you know, Pepe coin and this coin and that coin. You know, I advise people to just kind of stay away from that unless you're day trading and you're just trying to figure out a hot ticket. Uh, it's high risk, high reward, and, and not a game I want to play in. Yeah, I mean, the meme coins and that that game is is just that. It's just a game. You need to be immersed in it and watch the latest of it because uh, it's going to go quickly as well. It's not really investing, right? That's uh, that's just gambling. Uh, uh, but what you're describing is, and I think it's possible to invest in crypto. I think, uh, as you just described, there are now, uh, or that there's a, certainly an investment thesis. People are talking about BTC as it hits all-time all highs as we're uh, recording this episode. Uh, and then there's the fundamentals, right? Where are things going? What's the next? Uh, what's the next application or what are the next ways we're going? You mentioned things like Arweave, right? It's, I think it's going to be 
uh, important to uh, uh, consider where things are stored and link and how things are going to be uh, interconnected with each other. A lot of it's being built on Ethereum, as we know. I don't think that's going away any, anytime soon. Uh, and I guess from there, it's a question of how is it going to be adopted next, or I guess made use or more usable next? Are you looking at layer twos or anything like that on the Ethereum side of things? Not really. Um, basically, just on time. They just keep coming out left and right. I remember looking at a few of them, you know, a couple of years ago. And you know, to that point, if you're not day trading these or you're not gambling, um, knowing when to get into these projects is really, really important. Um, uh, knowing how to dollar cost average into stuff that you really like is really, really, really important. A lot of people don't understand that. They may see the buzz of Bitcoin today and go put a ton of dough into it because they don't want to miss the train as opposed to, you know, taking, you know, one fiftieth of what they put in today and put it in every week uh, or put it in every month and just, you know, put it in over a period of time and understand the value of dollar cost averaging. I think that's probably one of the biggest myths, JP, for retail investors is, you know, if you're not an expert in this area, take your time, understand what you're investing in and dollar cost average, you will protect your, you'll protect yourself a long way. Yeah, it's a good investment or it is a way to invest, obviously, with uh, uh, a much better way of managing because people are always trying to time, right? Time the high, time the low. And that's, uh, I think, proven to be a fruitless exercise. So, yeah, yes. certainly through the power of uh, dollar cost averaging. Why do you think there's so much, uh, why do you think leg, or sorry, Link has uh, so, many, so many legs in the future? Well, I think it's the repository of information that everybody's going to have to pay for to get access to. And, and I kind of look at it as, uh, this may not be a great analogy, but if you think about like database management, where all is, where is all this data of transactions and you know, where's all this going? And Link has proven to be a leader in that space and continue to have uh, entries into all of these major projects where they become the repository of, of that data. Uh, you know, there's there's another one with um, with Solana that is another project that I that I like substantially. Um, that the name is escaping, escaping me, but they're kind of like the file repository where everything's kind of going because the data just keeps coming in. The transaction layers keep coming in, right? Because every transaction stored forever, but it needs to be accessible by all these different chains, as you mentioned, right? And so it has to be a central repository and Link has done a really good job of that. And they've just been that steady, consistent player with functionality that I think over the long haul, you know, has a chance to win, but it's a different game, right? Link is playing it at a different game than some of these, you know, uh, ones that may hundred X. I think I see them more as a more stable uh, crypto project. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they built, they're building that infrastructure, right? To bring uh, real world on chain. Uh, and they seem to be getting some traction with that. What about uh, some of these? Okay. So more AI plays, uh, that we're hearing now. Have you come across anything like, uh, or even looked at things like Render or uh, BitTensor or things like that? Yeah. So, so um, by the way, our Weave and Render are two that I may have miscommunicated. Render is the one that's doing the the, the uh, visual imaging. That's uh, right. imaging. Sorry. Our Weave is actually the storage repository storage. for Solana. So I had those two reversed. Both of those projects I love. Um, so, so for that part, I love. What was the other one that you had mentioned? Uh, BitTensor as well. No, not familiar with that one. Not familiar with that. So I think it's trying to do a combination of those things uh, and uh, I think earlier stages. And so some people are saying, looking for the fundamentals and the, and the, the solution providers. Uh, and I think you've named a number of the ones that uh, are trying to create the uh, solutions uh, that we think are going to be required. You say storage, uh, rendering, uh, linking things. Uh, exactly. Because the power of the, the power of a blockchain, I think is going to, to be uh, empowered by AI, right? We talk about our businesses being powered by AI. I think the same thing is going to apply to, uh, is going to occur to those operating in the blockchain space. And at the, at the same time, we're going to see all kinds of noise, right? You described the meme coins and all these things. There's a lot of noise and people take advantage of those things. And that's where the, especially the retail loses. So again, part of scouring or making sure that you understand what's going on is asking these types of questions, listening to these types of shows and uh, giving yourself the most knowledge you possibly can to make the best possible decisions. So what do things look like in five years from now? What do you, you know, uh, this is a question I put to most uh, because again, it's just all anecdotal, right? You know, we're just trying to, uh, you know, trying to determine what the future is going to look like. And I think by talking about it, we actually in part help create that. So what is, what do things look like in five years from now, John? Yeah. And I'm assuming you're talking about globally and not just my particular businesses, right? Yeah. I, I, I think from the perspective of, uh, what you just talked about, right? The, the merger of blockchain 
and AI uh, technologies are all going to come together, right? Cryptocurrency is kind of another side product of tokenization of blockchain, right? So if you think about blockchain and AI, that's all coming together. And I truly believe, and I'm going to speak to small business entrepreneurs because that's the area that I'll play in here. Um, as, as a small to medium-sized entrepreneur, you, you mentioned this earlier, you need to have somebody in your business that's understanding where the puck is going, to use a hockey analogy, and continually be researching it. Because if you have your head in the sand and think what you've been doing for the last 10 years is going to be good for the next 10, you're missing incredible opportunities to grow your business substantially, use these tools to create higher margins. You can reinvest in your business, not dilute your equity by building your own net operating cash flow. But if you're missing the boat on how to increase your margins through these operational efficiencies of how these tools are all going to come together, um, you know, don't fall asleep too long because then your competitors who do figure it out will eat your lunch. So you really got to be highly focused as a small immune sized business entrepreneur to see where that's going and see how it can actually help implement into your business in a functional way, right? There's a lot of marketing tools, as an example, JP, that you a lot of from Opus Clip to digital tools for social media marketing and a whole bunch of different things on the marketing side. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs are really struggling to figure out, okay, how do I increase my operational margins through these tools that's really going to need to be researched in the next five years and figured out in your business? Yeah, that's well said. And things are going to change uh, so dramatically in the next five. We uh, are all earmarking 2030 as being the, the time frame. Uh, where we're looking at a whole new world, right? And so we're on our way there. John, appreciate your time here today and the way that you've given us some way to focus on that. Uh, some of the principles you discussed are really important. You, I got it all outlined in your book and you mentioned that uh, uh, the best way to get in touch with you from there. I'd like to end these shows with uh, one thing or maybe a, something that's worked for you in the past that you could pass on to, to others to take with them through the rest of the day, through the rest of the week after they listen to the show. Yeah, the one message, JP, uh, that I had to learn the hard way, but it's now something I, I preach to everybody that will listen, have patient ambition. I like where, that. You know, patient even ambition. Where, yeah, even where things are going instead of the next five years, I mean, stay healthy for the next five years. You may live forever. Like there's so many things going on in this world, but be patient. We have a long road. A lot of times as entrepreneurs, as business people, we want to do things right away. We want instant gratification right away. If you can be very ambitious, ambitious, excuse me, but have the patience to take your time and plan things out correctly and build foundational blocks, keep building and building and building and have the grit to persevere through things, just like we did in our college pro days, but we didn't have patience then. We just had, we we're ambitious. If you have the patient ambition to persevere and build through these times, you will be rewarded. Patient ambition. Thanks very much, John. I appreciate having you on the show. Look forward to the next time. Thank you, JP. Thank you.